Eh, vamos a hablar de dos temas transversales, finanzas para la sostenibilidad y la medición para poder eh, ver el impacto que tienen las iniciativas que realizamos. Para arrancar este bloque, invitamos a Gervé Dutail, Director Global de Sostenibilidad de BNP Paribas. Un aplauso. Por favor. Okay, I'll start from here. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Hervé Dutay, I'm Chief Sustainability Officer at BNP Paribas. And I will talk today uh, to you about sustainable finance. Uh, in fact, just to introduce myself, I've been a trader for more than 20 years. And about six years ago, I switched job to um, start this uh, sustainable finance practice at BNP Paribas. And quite honestly, over the last six years has been the time when sustainable finance has started to uh, emerge. So 2019 is a very exciting year. That's what I call the, the sustainable, uh, sustainability revolution. It's a, it's a time when oil companies are investing in renewables. It's a time when vacuum cleaner companies are manufacturing cars. And it's a time when car, ma car companies are leasing bicycles. But it's also a time when banks are reinventing finance. <coughs> so today I'd like to, tell, to, to take you through this journey, this story of sustainable finance, and look at three, three themes. First, why is sustainable finance uh, emerging? And we'll see that it's really very much driven by investors. The second is what have we invented? And you'll see that there are three re revolutions uh, going on in sustainable finance. And let's, last, what is the future of finance? So first, let's start why, about the why. Why is it that sustainable finance in, is emerging? And I'll take you through three main reasons. There are many more. But the first one is it makes sense to incorporate environmental, social, and governance elements when you start selecting stocks or bonds to make up portfolios. It does improve long-term uh, risk-adjusted returns. When I was a trader, I was very much focused on the top two, liquidity and market risk. And if you're working in banks, you know that counterparty risk and credit risk um, over a five-year five horizons do matter. But we, over the last few years, we start to understand that's what we call extra financial risk, environmental, social, and governance do impact um, stocks. In fact, stocks are valued as a combination of tangible assets and the value of what we call intangible assets. So intangible assets are brand value, reputation, ability to innovate, but also ability to uh, manage the energy transition, um, your social responsibility vis-a-vis -vis your supply chain, and so on. So if you go back 50 years ago, you take S&P 500, intangible assets make up, made up less than 20% of a stock value. So this is um, the, the, the portion of intangibles for the valuation of S&P 500 companies. Today, intangible assets make up more than 80% of a stock value. And what we call ESG, environment, social, and governance elements are part of this. So here in this graph, we're looking at uh, a, 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 a global stock index. And in pink, it's the same index filtered for good um, environmental and social and governance um, issues that are well handled by firms. You can see that we outperform typically the regular um, um, uh, stock market. In fact, this, this one is actually only filtered for environmental issues. If you broaden your filter and s select stocks that are not only good environmental um, uh, companies, but do handle social and governance issues, you can see that the outperformance is much wider. And if you do the same exercise in emerging markets, had you done this for the last 10 years, you would have outperformed by more than 80%, which makes sense in emerging countries where maybe the regulatory framework is less stringent than in some other parts of the world. Paying attention to good environmental, social, and governance behaviors do make a difference. 
So investors do know that. This is a survey we just did a few months ago, and you can see that now more than 50% of investors do believe that good ESG does improve long-term returns. It's extremely well documented um, in academia. It's not 100% uh, bulletproof, but the evidence is very strong. But what matters is what investors believe, and more than half of investors today do believe that if you select good, be good be uh, behaviors, you improve stock returns. The second reason is um, sustainable finance is driven by um, investors and especially retail investors. The same way you want to see organic yogurts uh, in your supermarket, the same way you want to have good ESG uh, funds offered by your asset managers. Um, same survey that we did a few months ago, uh, two years ago when we asked investors uh, whether they were incorporating ESG criteria in, their, in, in more than 25% of their funds, about 50% of them were doing this type of analysis. Two dates around 75%. When we ask them their expectation in two years from now, more than 90% of investors will do ESG analysis for more than 25% of their funds. The last reason I'd like to mention, it's actually um, a reason that has been uh, developed by Bob Eccles from Harvard Business School. And it's about large asset managers and large asset owners. Um, the asset management industry is heavily concentrated. If you think of all externally managed assets in the world, 25% of externally managed assets are handled by the top, by five firms. So BlackRock, and others, five of those do handle 25% of all the mo money around the world that's externally managed. And actually the top 10 do manage about 33% of all that money. So what it means is this industry is heavily concentrated. It means that modern pot portfolio theory that says to protect your stock you should diversify, it's not gonna work here. Uh, you cannot hedge against systemic risk, against climate crisis, against um, consequences of migration when your portfolio is so large. So asset managers have only one way to defend themselves. It's to go and talk to companies that are issuing stocks and bonds and ask and request strong governance, very good environmental and social behaviors because we cannot let the planet fail, because if we let the planet fail, we're gonna let portfolio fail. So these are the, some of the reasons behind the sustainable finance revolution. Now, what is it? I see three revolutions happening at the same time. The first one, I would say it's the so-called labeled financing, or uh, it's bonds or loans that have been developed to finance a very specific purpose. So we have created green bonds, social bonds, SDG bonds, blue bonds, um, pandemic emergency bonds, gender bonds. Lately, a rhino bond was done. So those bonds are raising money for a very specific purpose. And that's one of the revolution of sustainable finance. It's dedicating uh, the use of proceeds for an environmental and or social friendly cause. But something else is happening and it's linking impact and returns. So tell, let me tell you about the story of this um, uh, loan that was done about a year ago by Danone. <coughs> Last uh, February 2018, Danone um, borrowed two billion euros uh, in the form of a revolving credit facility. So it's a, it's a line of money that they can draw. The novelty in this two billion euro loan is that a little portion of the interest rate that Danone is paying is linked to the social and environmental performance of the company. So if the company does better from an ESG perspective, they will pay less on the interest rate, and if they do worse, they will pay more. It's very revolutionary in the sense that until now, when banks lend money to, some, to a borrower, the interest rate is only linked to your ability to repay the money. Here, the rate is linked to the ability of Danone to repay the money and to have impact. That's what Forbes titled right after the deal, what every CFO should know, 
in the future, cost of funding will not only be linked to the ability to repay, but also to the ability to do good. And the third revolution that's starting to happen now, it's that we're also linking um, um, uh, uh, return and cost of risk, impact and cost of risk. And we see this especially among rating age, credit rating agencies. Until about two years ago, credit rating agencies were a little bit late in catching up with the trend, trend of analy analyzing environmental and social issues when it comes to the impact it has on the credit worthiness of the issuer. But over the last two years, and especially this year, they're catching up. Fitch, in January uh, of this year, announced that now they had a very formal methodology to link environmental, social, and governance issues with the credit rating. In fact, if you're a Fitch subscriber, you can go on the website and you can change the ESG score if you don't believe the ESG score and see the impact it has on the credit rating. As well, in April, we saw Moody's acquiring a majority stake in VGO Iris. VGO Iris is an extra financial rating agency. So the same way SNP or Moody's analyze credit, VGO Iris analyze environmental, social, and governance issues at companies. Moody's has been acquiring them. If they do so, it's certainly because they are heavily refl reflecting on how linking more closely credit ratings and ESG ratings. So let me conclude on the future of finance. I'm not an economist but, or uh, a sustainable development specialist, but this, this is the list of uh, the 10 problems I can see in the world. And these are my 10 solutions. And actually, when you have an energy problem, you have a finance problem. So bankers have a lot of work ahead. Investment banks are indeed at the center of infrastructure needs. Uh, we do a lot of project financing, and project finance is key to finance this type of smart roads. We do a lot of uh, solar panel installations in the world, as you know. These typically cost between ten and $20,000. These are small loans. Companies, startups, are lending money, actually, to do this. But e eventually, when, when they have 100, 200, 300 million dollars of $20,000 loans to consumers, they cannot carry them on balance sheet. We need to do what we call to securitize them, to take those loans, repackage them, and sell them to the public. Investment banks do that. Investment banks have also invented green loans, as I mentioned, green bonds earlier, and green loans can be an attractive way to finance new projects that are at the heart of sustainable agriculture. Investment banks finance supply chains for large, client, for large uh, companies. Now we've invented a, su a supply chain financing product where the interest rate that the supplier pays will move up or down significantly depending on the supplier's sustainability uh, results. Investment banks are also at the center of the sharing economy. You know, now goods are seen more as services. Uh, IKEA, for example, you know that sell furniture, is now looking at renting furniture. Um, to finance that, it's called leasing. Again, banks are uh, leasing experts. So I think this is the revolution we're seeing in finance. We started five years ago, and I think we have another 45 years ahead of us. Over the last 70 years, finance has invented funding mechanisms to finance people who take risk to make money. And that's what we call private um, venture capital, private equity, mezzanine finance, and so on and so on. These financings are critical. They have, behi they have been behind the innovation. The Silicon Valley, you know, all those startups have been, uh, could exist thanks to these forms of financing. But today, we're starting to invent new funding mechanisms for people who are taking risk to do good. And that's when the interest rate is linked to the impact. So if you ask me what is the roadmap of um, the uh, sustainable finance revolution, we're just at the very beginning of it. This is an analogy. We're here in sustainable finance. 
That's where we were 20 years ago when the cellular phone was almost invented. And then it took another 10 years to get there. And it took another 10 years to create all those type of economies that generates billions of GDP and employ million, millions of people. So the roadmap of 21st century finance is the following for this century. Fulfilling the SDGs by inventing new funding mechanisms that will scale up all the good ideas and all the good projects we've heard today and yesterday. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Hervé. Te invitamos a sentarte para participar del panel a continuación. Um, could you please uh, join us in the panel? Um, realmente, con la innovación tecnológica y Eh, las finanzas sostenibles pueden ser game changer para poder llevar esto a cabo. Invitamos al siguiente panel a Alison Genovés, de la directora de Global Reporting Initiative, conocida como GRI, y para moderar el panel a David Saetone, presidente de Andean Crown. Eh, bienvenidos. Muy buenos días. Muy buenos días a todos. Uh, thank you very much for your brilliant presentation. It was very, very clear. Uh, and, and I love the way that you've, you've structured uh, the analysis. Uh, Allison, um, GRI plays a very important role uh, in uh, providing information for investors to make decisions. Uh, so could you please shed some light on that for us? Sure, so um, thank you and, and welcome. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. Um, for many of you who are familiar with GRI, um, I'll just indulge me for a moment um, for those who aren't. We provide the um, standards, the global standards that organizations use to disclose on their um, non-financial, their extra financial, their sustainability impacts. And we believe that uh, that private sector is a force for public good, is a force for sustainable development, but in order for that to happen, the information that companies provide to their stakeholders including their investors, must be consistently uh, delivered, must be comparable between companies, and has to be digestible for the stakeholders. And that's where the standards come in, so that companies aren't responsible for deciding what is an environmental impact or what is a social impact or uh, you know how to measure those impacts, um, which allows investors and others to have um, decision useful information as um, was just described. Right. And uh, uh, Erva, in your presentation you mentioned uh, that one of the key drivers uh, for, for this movement uh, is that improves risk adjusted returns. Um, sometimes we're not aware of what impact climate change and uh, lack of governance uh, and lack of uh, social inclusion can have on investments. Could you please give us some examples so that we can get a sense of what you mean by risk-adjusted returns? So I'll have two, two ways of answering. The first one is, yes, there are concrete examples. Um, when, I mean, the famous one is uh, Volkswagen, for example. Uh, in fact, if you, uh, companies such as uh, True Value Labs and others uh, and Sustainalytics um, had spotted for quite a while uh, weakness in governance issues, and we know all, we all know what happened. Uh, and there are num numerous such examples. Um, but I think what's more important um, is that when a company disclose is very transparent around environmental and social issues and is disclosing, it's actually signaling that it has a long-term uh, visionary management. It's not so much uh, solely about, it's, it's very hard to predict uh, when climate change is gonna hit one company because uh, when, when a hurricane is gonna ha harm some physical assets, um, it, globally there will be uh, losers, if you wish, of those issues. It's very hard to predict company by company. But being transparent and being focused also on environmental and social issues and being even ready to disclose that to shareholders is really a sign that the management is long-term thinking. 
um, and 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 it's and I think that's what investors really take away that it's um, it's a sign of very strong management and not doing it is starting to be a sign that it might be questionable. Right, and and taking that point uh, when uh, we were discussing earlier, Allison, uh, about uh, where we're at with reports. Uh, do you think that all companies now know what to do with information or there are some companies that are better prepared or better able to do that and what challenges do we have? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, the analogy of the cell phone is, is really apt. For those of us who've been in this field for, you know, many, many years now, um, it feels like this has been a long time coming, but we need to recognize that as a market, we're still very new at being able to access the data, to digest the data correctly, and then actually know what to do with it. Some of these re recent acquisitions, um, such as S&P acquiring um, TrueCost and others, is that there's a recognition that this information is important. But then when you ask investors, you know, okay, so what are you doing with the data? They're not quite sure yet. I think the um, it is w seen as a proxy for good governance. It's a s proxy for, um, this information is a proxy for good management. And we're also seeing um, that uh, organizations are just now even internally learning how to take this information and feed it back into their management systems, into R&D, into capital allocation, um, because it is new data that um, companies are really learning about and, and how it can be powerful for them. And if I may add to this, uh, you also have a couple, uh, many external drivers for that data. Uh, new drivers, um, I'll, I'll cite two of them. One is the emergence of new types of investors. Um, we call them green investors, social investors, sustainable investors, that will only invest in companies uh, that do disclose that will only invest sometimes in companies that only issue in a certain format. So you have green bond funds now around the world. Um, green bond funds will only buy green bonds. So if you issue a regular bond, they will not buy uh, such a bond. If you issue a green bond, you know at BlackRock, for example, or PIMCO, um, they have regular funds, they have green bond funds, they have sustainable funds. When you issue a green bond, you're gonna get orders from the green bond fund, from the sustainable fund, and from the regular fund. So there's much more demand for that paper. So the emergence of sustainable investors is creating new pockets of money, uh, of demand for, for, for securities, and issuing in the right format will actually um, maximize your chances to get actually a better price. The other forces I want, new force I wanted to um, cite is regulation. We see it a lot in Europe. Uh, and for example, in, in Europe, um, one, uh, one thing is being considered currently, which is, you know, when you invest money with an asset manager, they do a, a financial sustainability questionnaire, asking, are you risk averse, you know, et cetera, et cetera. There could be a requirement soon to also do a sustainability questionnaire. So ask the 70-year-old widow, you know, do you want to be invested in defense? Do you want to be invested in uh, uh, tobacco and so on? And so the investor will have to answer those questions and then the asset manager will have the obligation to disclose, first of all, what's in the funds they're proposing. So even in S&P 500, you should know how much tobacco that there is, et cetera, et cetera. And they should also be able to propose investment solutions that do fit the financial and the sustainability requirement of the investor. So these are forces that are, will drive more and more demand on data. The other thing that's changing now is really we're having a language change. When um, for years you would um, talk to CEOs and, um, and vice presidents of investor relations and they'd say, well, we never get questions about sustainability from our investors on quarterly calls. And first of all, we realize that quarterly calls are a terrible way to get um, real-time information from your investors. Um, however, what we're also saying, well, okay, are they asking you about long-term asset protection? Well, yes, they are. Are they talking to you about um, risk within your supply chain? Yes, they are. And what we're seeing now is that those are what is seen before as operational questions. We're talking about it in the sustainability community as sustainable que sustainability questions, and the two weren't being really linked internally. 
And that, I think, is changing. I think it's changing as the maturity of the sustainability community is, um, is the, the value within companies is evolving. And I also think that the investor community is starting to understand that these quote unquote sustainability topics are not some kind of, you know, earthy, crunchy person off on the sidelines, but that they're actually really tied into business um, and operational longevity and planning. Right, that's, that's really interesting. You know, uh, one of our funds runs uh, uh, probably the main reforestation program uh, in, in Peru in order to recover degraded lands. And uh, we got a call from a potential investor that shocked me, and that was Shell, the oil company. And at the beginning, my, my uh, position was that I didn't want to deal with them because they were going to just greenwash themselves. And then looking into this, um, we saw that this had been investor driven uh, by some pension funds who had a significant position there. And uh, they put the agenda on the company's uh, board uh, meetings. And then they even linked the executive's compensation to ESG goals. And that's what explained this interest changing the company's uh, objective from hydrocarbon to energy, uh, setting up, I think, $2 billion for investment uh, in clean technology, batteries, electric batteries, uh, and that sort of thing. And then they recognized that they will not be able to reduce their emissions until, I think, 2035. Uh, so the way that they are looking to compensate this is by reforestation. Uh, but they really need, uh, their analysis is that they need to uh, plant, I think, an area size of Brazil in order to, to, uh, to uh, reduce to zero their, their carbon footprint. And that's, I thought that was an, an amazing example of, of how investors are making things happen. Can you tell us about uh, another example or that, that you know in Peru or in, in, the, in the region or maybe in the States? Sure. So I think um, investors are not a monolith, right? So there's many different types of investors and many different types of pressures on companies to think differently. The one that uh, comes to mind uh, that's perhaps a little bit different is um, in, in the U United States, there was, you may have seen um, that the Amazon employees walked out because they wanted um, the board of directors and they wanted um, the leadership team to begin disclosing climate impact um, of the company and the board of directors and the leadership team have very little interest in publicly disclosing this information and so 7,000 employees um, sent a letter and walked out in protest and, um, and it to me was a very good example of they were not asking Amazon to be climate neutral they were not asking Amazon to put together millions of dollars in, in projects what they wanted was data what they wanted was information and to show that the company was managing this and that the company actually had a sense of its impacts. And those, in, those are employees, but those are also investors. And so we're seeing this kind of disconnect between what boards of directors and management team and perhaps, you know, this is a generational shift. We can make some assumptions on gender and, and, um, and uh, other sorts of demographic differences. But what we're seeing is that employees are taking ownership and seeing themselves as investors in the company and that they want this information. We'll see what happens, but certainly other companies are taking notice and are using their um, GRI-based reports and other reporting as a mechanism to show their investors that they have a handle on um, these issues and that they have a variety of different ways to solve against it. Would you like to mention another example, uh, Hervé? Or maybe I can ask you, uh, here in Peru we have a pretty significant uh, pension fund system and mutual fund industry. Um, from your perspective and your experience and what you've seen uh, in the past, uh, how do you think that the market uh, and, and the pension fund system uh, mainly uh, can help implement SDGs in Peru and make things happen? So I'll, maybe I'll tell you my wish. Okay. <laughs> um, 
La Latin America is a bit different at this stage um, from, first of all, from Europe, where <coughs> a lot of this is really driven, driven fast. Uh, to some extent, uh, North America um, and Asia is also emerging, but um, in Latin America, we don't see very, a, a lot of per se sustainable investors. They're fairly small. Um, and there's no reason to be. Um, and as you say, pension funds are actually key players, key, key investors in this region, um, fairly concentrated to some, to some extent. So my, my wish, and I know they're very open to it, um, my wish is that they act collectively. Sometimes it's hard to be um, a first mover, and I know in some countries, actually, pension funds are somewhat benchmarked to each other, which uh, might not be helping. So my wish is that they, they make one more step forward altogether. This way they'll be probably benchmarked. Um, but I think there are a lot of sustainable investment solutions, um, which, let's face it, don't save the world, but do signal something very strong. Um, and actually that do express what investees, you know, where, where future pension is, uh, or, or retail investors really are thinking and wishing for their future and for their children. And, 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 and given the goodness and the power of pension funds uh, here in Peru and, and Colombia and, and other countries, my wish actually is that we, we, we talk collectively on what we can do and what we can signal uh, to, to the region. Excellent. Well, I have this red light flashing here. We're out of time, but do you have any final thoughts, Alison? Um, just quickly. Uh, no, thank you. Um, I think it's just getting started mm -hmm. um, that companies will are providing the data. They're providing the information now. And so as stakeholders, you should talk to them and you should hear from them um, so that they can improve that data because the worst thing that companies will say is that they put the data out and then no one gives them feedback on it. And so I think that sort of dialogue can be very helpful for you as investors, for you as employees, and for um, the companies overall to improve the quality of their information. Well, thank you very much both. And thank, thank you, everyone. You, David.